Hey, it's John, and welcome to the interview. Today, I'm joined by Billy Prim, who is the creator and founder of Blue Rhino Propane, which he sold for $343 million. He's now the founder of Primo Water Corporation, which helps to provide safer drinking water to the world. And he's actually grown that company to a larger market value than Blue Rhino. So here's a guy who's built two companies over the $300 million mark, has a ton of wisdom. We're excited to have him share some of that today with us on this interview. Uh, so today we're gonna be digging into his journey, how he started and exited Blue Rhino, how he's growing Primo Water, and along the way he stayed true to five key principles for life and leadership. We'll be talking about those as well. Billy, thank you so much for coming by and sharing your thoughts, your wisdom, your time with everyone listening today. Thank you, John, good afternoon. All right, let's do it. So tell us a little bit about your Growing up in North Carolina, you're a small town guy, but tell us what that was like. Give the listeners a little bit of, of a, a glimpse into your life as a young man. Hey, well, well good. Glad, glad to do that. Uh, John, I grew up in uh, Yadkin County, North Carolina. It's a rural community outside of Winston-Salem. And I basically grew up on a tobacco farm. Uh, my father and grandfather were uh, in the farm supply business. We raised tobacco and, uh, uh, and, and to be honest, it was a great childhood <laughs> and a great place to learn some discipline, work ethics, and things that really helped me later in life. So uh, uh, a, a great place to grow up and, and a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Who are some of your early role models growing up? Yeah, well, at, at an early age, uh, it, it was really my father and, and grandfather. Uh, they, they taught me a lot about life, and, and it's good that, that they taught me early. Uh, just to give you a little more of my story is um, when I was a freshman in college at NC State, uh, my father unexpectedly and my grandfather shortly after committed suicide mm. and uh, it left me uh, at uh, age 19 with uh, taking care of my mom two younger sisters and so I had to grow up in a hurry um, but but I was fortunate to have some of those mentors that you talked about uh, a guy named Don Angel who was an entrepreneur in Winston-Salem in the uh, healthcare and hospitality business. Uh, and, and, and I did a, a lot of studying and reading about entrepreneurship. I knew from an early age, I wanted to be in business. Uh, so I, I went to, to school on nights and weekends and uh, was fortunate enough to uh, score high enough on the GMAT to get into uh, MBA graduate school at Wake Forest University uh, without an undergraduate degree. Mm. And, and it was there I, I really learned some of the, the disciplines of how to read a balance sheet. And uh, as I tell people, one of the key things I learned was about owner financing. And, and that's how I, I started some of my first businesses, is buying businesses through uh, uh, owners who wanted to retire, who could uh, finance the business for them. Did you buy any businesses before you did Blue Rhino or like, was that your first big endeavor? No, no, I, I, I did. I, I uh, when I, when I left graduate school, uh, the first business I bought was a uh, heating oil distributorship. And, and I, I was, what I did is, is I uh, was able to acquire three or four different heating oil distributorships, roll them up into a, a, what we call a diversified, petroleum marketer. We had a chain of convenience stores, we had propane gas, and we had home, home heating oil and lubricants uh, throughout uh, central North Carolina and, and uh, southern Virginia. So okay. that was my first business and that's where I, I learned about the propane business that eventually got me into the Blue Rhino aspect. Got it. So getting into graduates to graduate school uh, taught you about owner finance, as you said, and then you used that strategy to acquire, you know, what a company, and then you did a roll up into a few others, and and that's how you got started, huh? That, that's true. That, that's how I got started in the uh, petroleum uh, distribution business. Uh, as far as Blue Rhino, 
that was my first large business. And uh, the uh, story of how I started Blue Rhino, I was, I, my wife and I had won a trip to Europe. Uh, and we were traveling in Europe when I saw that people in, in Paris were exchanging propane cylinders there. It was butane, but they were exchanging their cylinders instead of refilling them the way we did here in the United States. When I came back, I, I talked to my folks and I said, guys, I think this would be an interesting concept. The refill process is, is a dirty, nasty uh, experience. And I said, this makes all the sense in the world. Let's try it in some of my convenience stores. So we tried it and it was just a small test. But one day the local Walmart manager stopped by my office and he said, really? He said, we have a problem at Walmart. He said, we sell hundreds of gas grills, but have nowhere to send our customers to buy gas. Would you think about doing this for Walmart? That's when the light went off. And uh, that was, uh, that, that was a, uh, a special day, uh, but that was the beginning of the concept. From there, um, what I did is uh, I decided it was time to write a business plan. Uh, my wife and I uh, uh, decided that uh, we were going on an African safari, a photographic safari, and I had all this time between uh, the U.S. and South Africa uh, playing time, and I told her I'm going to write a business plan. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure I did is I wanted to create a brand that was recognizable, something that could do for us what the Pink Panther did in Owens Corning. So while I was on this photographic safari, I was photographing a uh, rhino, and I decided that he was this tough, sturdy character that looked like a tank. And uh, I got a graphic artist to put the blue flame and propane on him. And uh, I said, that's it. That, I'm going to call this Blue Rhino. And everybody thought I was crazy. <laughs> they, really, they said, what kind of name is that? I said, people will remember it. And, and it turned out to be one of our biggest assets through the years because it was so recognizable and rememberable. Yeah. Easy to say, easy to remember, a great icon or a great, you know, logo and all that kind of stuff. So you were right. You were right. So, okay. So you, so you, you got the idea overseas, you took it back, you started it as a small test and then just, was it just the circumstances that the guy from Walmart came over and said, Billy, I think we should plug this into our, our distribution network or what? Is that how it was? <laughs> it's never that easy. And, uh, right. There's always a lot of uh, ups and downs in any business venture. Uh, what, what, after writing a business plan, I uh, went to Walmart, uh, talked to the folks in Bentonville, and they gave me a list of 25 or 30 different things that I would have to do before they would even test that. They said, listen, this is a hazardous material. These are little bombs you're wanting to put in front of our stores. You'd have to have a hundred million dollars worth of insurance. You'd have to have all these other things. But I took notes, took everyone down, listened intently, went back, raised money to put into the venture, raised some venture capital money, uh, and sold a lot of my assets so I'd have a uh, uh, the capital to roll this out. Once I checked off everything on, on their list, I went back to Walmart. I said, guys, here I have. I've checked off insurance. I've checked off capital. I've checked off all these things that you asked me to do. I'm ready to go. They looked at me and they said, Billy, said, we still think it's a good idea, but we're just not quite ready. Oh, not ready. At this point, after all that, you just did, huh? Holy cow. Oh, man. I'm on the plane coming back home and I'm thinking, Lord, I am Scott. I've got everybody revved up. I'm ready to go. So I knew uh, a guy up at Lowe's Home Improvement, who was a good North Carolina company, and I said, uh, can you get me a meeting with somebody at Lowe's Home Improvement? So I went up to Lowe's Home Improvement the following week, and they said, well, we think this is a great idea. We've got a new store that's getting ready to open up in your hometown. Why don't you go there and start? 
and let's get a test going. So I came back, I set up the store in Winston-Salem, and in one week, John, seven days, Home Depot called me. And they mm. said, we saw what you're doing over at the Lowe's Home Improvement Store in Winston-Salem. We need you to come to Atlanta and talk to us. From there, the light went off with all of them. And I was fortunate enough, this is the early 90s, that Lowe's, Home Depot, and Walmart were building stores like crazy. So it was more about the complexity in my part of raising enough capital and keeping up with the growth aspects for the 10-year run that we had there. So it was a 10-year run at that point. So once Home Depot came in and these other places came in, everyone saw each other looking at this as a good opportunity. Then they all just kind of jumped on board at that point because they all they were all looking at it and kind of saw it as a, as a good idea. Yeah, they, they, they did. And that, that was that I don't want to make it sound easy because it's not. No. We had to uh, we, we had to uh, keep up with their growth aspects. Plus, it's very difficult to keep uh, these large retailers happy. I'll tell, I'll tell you one story just to give you a sense of some of the issues that pop up. Propane, for the most part, is, uh, is not used in the summertime. It's used for heating purposes in the wintertime. When the grilling occurs in the summertime, there's usually plenty of propane available and it's at really low prices. Mm. So therefore, we didn't think that we had a supply problem. Well, in, in the summer of 2000, natural gas prices went through the roof and people started using propane to run refineries, which caused propane to, to triple and quadruple in price. So we needed to find a way to pass this price increase on. So I, I go back to Walmart and I, I tell the folks that, uh, hey, you can see what's happened to propane prices. I need to increase my price to, uh, to, to compens be compensated for the price of propane. The folks at Walmart looked at me and said, uh, Billy said, did you not agree to sell us at this price for this calendar year? Yeah. So we did, however, they said, and there isn't any however, that we'll look at changing prices when it gets to January 1. Between now and then, if you can't uh, uh, serve us at the price you agree, we'll need to find somebody that can. Wow. So I go back and by then we're a public company. I have to tell the market, our stock goes from 24 to two, <laughs> to two. And all the, the, the issues that that starts to cause when you're a public company and, and everybody is focused on next quarter and the following quarter. And, and it did cause us a lot of uh, damage because we lost a lot of money. We were losing money on every tank we sold. But I knew that if I could get through that year, that I could readjust the prices and truthfully, the price of propane was gonna come back down. We knew that if we could get through that year, that we had a great business and it would return. So during that year, we had all kinds of problems. I had to work tirelessly to keep everybody's head in the game, internally and externally, and raise enough capital to feed the monster during that period of time. Wow. However, once we got through it all, for four years running, we were one of the highest performing stocks on NASDAQ. So, uh, it, 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 it's not easy. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in running any kind of business, especially a fast growing business. And, and that's just one example. How you have to be resilient to get through it. Yeah. How did you sleep? And how did that feel to you as the leader? I mean, were you <laughs> able to sleep? Were you just like, how, how did you hold your, your emotional IQ together during such turbulent times? Well, I, I think that's one of the keys, and that, that's one of the things I talk about in, in my lessons for life and leadership is that it was so important, and I knew that, that I remained calm, that nobody could see a change in me. They couldn't see me sweat. They couldn't 
me worried about, were we going to be able to make payroll next week? No matter what the paper says, no matter what articles are written about the possibility of bankruptcy for Blue Rhino, I knew that I had to share my vision of where we're going and remain positive and upbeat. And yeah. that worked. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't imagine. So, so you grew this company over a 10-year period to, to great heights and sold it uh, or were acquired, right? Um, yeah, what were some of, the, I guess, just broad mistakes you feel like you made or made or lessons learned growing that company like that big? Yeah, there, there's... There's several lessons that I, I would uh, put out there. The, the the first one that I always tell people and, and that I learned along the way is that um, you should never do business with people or let them invest in uh, be your partners or invest in your company that do not have the same value system as you have. Because things are always great when business is booming and everything's going. But you need to know who you're in business with when things go sideways. And they always will. So one of the things I always say is choose your partners, your suppliers, everybody you deal with, your employees. Choose wisely and make sure that they have the same value system that you do. And what are some of those values that you cherished at that time? Well, I, I, I think my, my value system, and we, we have our, our values written on the wall, and that, that is treat everybody with respect no matter what the uh, occasion or what, what the situation is. You having integrity in everything you do, and whether it's you're dealing with your customers or your suppliers, uh, whoever that, that, th those simple type things are important that you live them out. And it's important that the leadership of a company lives those values every day. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, before when we were talking how important it is to get the right people on the bus before your company starts growing. So, you know, I think you talked about hiring ahead of where your current growth was, right? So obviously, so if, if you, when you do end up growing, the people that are on the bus already can handle that growth. Can you, can you touch on what you meant by that? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what I'm saying, when, when you're going to have a, a company that is a fast-growing company, a high-growth company, I think you have to hire people that have the skill set to run the business where you're going to be at in two years, not where you're at today. And I, I made the mistake of hiring some people early on because they're less expensive. I knew the people, but they didn't have that skill set. And so when the business became more complex and uh, larger and you had to juggle more balls, I had to let them go and hire somebody different. And the time and energy that it takes to make that change is really difficult. So I, I think one of the learnings is, as you said, you got to hire ahead, hire people with a skill set for where you see yourself at in two or three years, not where you're at today. Is there like a benchmark for that? Because I imagine that's pretty made you nervous, maybe too. Because you know, obviously, the bigger, the better players, so to speak, are more expensive, right? And uh, you know, is there a time where is there a certain rule there? Because you know, a startup or a younger company might sweat a little bit hiring an A player to to be on their team, but as you say, it could be the right move if they grow, right? Yeah, well, I, I think you have to, and, and it's just as hard to convince that A player to come in. Right. Because they, they, they look at it and say, well, heck, I've been running a $200 million division at this large company. I don't know if I'm gonna take a risk on the startup. Right. So it is something that you, as the leader or the founder, have to take, have to be able to tell your story and your vision of where you're going and where you're going to mm -hmm. be. That's to, that's to get people, raise the capital needed, and, and quite frankly, your customers want to hear it too. Yeah. So you really think it's the story and the vision that in, in, that brings in those A players to a startup because they're already doing well. They're probably already making a good living at their current situation. You know, 
the, you know, money could be one motivator, but it's, it, you feel like it's really, it comes down to the, the vision, the story, inspiring them that way. It, it is. And you have to sell yourself. They have to believe that you, that your vision is something that you can execute and you have to give them a piece of the act. Not mm-hmm. only is it money, they, they, they all want to be aboard that ship for equity and, and to realize some of that. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so you grew up the company and you sold the company, any tips around that? And then let's transition over to starting Primo water. Yeah. Well, let, let me tell you why I sold the company. It, it really wasn't what I wanted to do or, nor was it the, uh, the, the reason for building up the company. Um, we, we, as I said, we were a public company, which, uh, requires you to continue to find growth every quarter, every year. They're looking at year over year growth in top line and bottom line. Well, by 2004, we had more locations in the U S than McDonald's, Wendy's and Burger King combined. Wow. That. If you had fast food in your town, you had Blue Rhino. We were everywhere. So we had to find places to grow. And I started looking in, in uh, China, I looked in Brazil, in Mexico, and all the, all the high growth areas of the world where this would make some sense. And the business model didn't work there. All of those countries, uh, they have privatized uh, the whole energy sector. In other words, you had to buy propane from the government and they tell you what you can sell it at. So our business model didn't work internationally. Mm-hmm. So as I came back and I discussed with our board of directors what we could do, could we take the company private? Uh, are there other uh, verticals that we want to get into? We looked at gas grills, we looked at some other things. Um, a, a gentleman out of Kansas City that owned an MLP named Feral Gas came to us and made us an all cash offer uh, at a very high multiple. And um, the, he, he agreed to leave the headquarters in Winston Salem, operated as a separate division, continued to be Blue Rhino. Um, and it turned out everybody, every, everybody, the the employees stayed on for the most part. The, uh, uh, there was, everybody made plenty of money. It was an all cash deal. So um, everybody was happy, probably except me. I just sold my baby. <laughs> yeah, it's gotta be tough. So, yeah. so you sold the company and then what, did you take some time to kind of reflect on life? And then how did you come up with the opportunity to start Primo Water? I, I did, I, I, I took a, uh, uh, a few months to really think about that as I was trying to, uh, to help the transition of Blue Rhino into feral gas. Uh, I, I looked around and, and I uh, thought about it and prayed about it. And, uh, you know, I, I decided that uh, God didn't make me to lie here on the beach. Uh, he, he gave me some skills and uh, I needed to use those skills. Uh, so, uh, at that time, Lowe's and Home Depot had both asked me if I would try to create a Blue Rhino-like program for five-gallon bottled water. They were selling water dispensers but had nowhere to send the customers to buy water, similar to the, the uh, gas grill and the uh, propane story. Mm. I got a couple of young MBAs to, uh, to help me research the market, write a business plan, and uh, after looking at it, I, I really believe that this whole health and hydration uh, is something that's not a fad. It is going to be around for a long time. Clean water is going to be more and more important to people as public water systems become uh, more and more contaminated. Uh, so I put the band back together and started again with a sheet of paper, uh, just uh, a business plan and started from scratch. And then you had those, the distribution connections, right? Already from the previous endeavor and your reputation, of course, and things like that, your connections. And so you were able to get, was it a pretty quick momentum starter for that company or did it take a little while? 
Well, it, it was a little faster than uh, Blue Rhino uh, because I did have those things that you mentioned. I was I, I was able to bring some people from Blue Rhino in, into my system. I had the distribution uh, contacts out there, and and of course all the retailers knew me. So we started out day one with Lowe's Home Improvement uh, installing them nationwide. So we were a nationwide company within the first six months of setting up business. Uh, it, it also helped with the reputation that we had established at Blue Rhino that uh, I, I was able to take uh, Primo public at a, at a very early time, uh, probably too early in hindsight, but uh, we, we went public basically on the reputation of what we had done at um, Blue Rhino without any profits or a really significant history in the business. Wow. Very cool. And then since you've now grown this company to lar- a larger market value than, than Blue Rhino, correct? We have. We have. And, and, and coincidentally, we just merged uh, Primo Water uh, with another company that uh, was a little larger. So uh, we, we merged at a valuation of $775 million, uh, announced it last week with Cot Corporation. Uh, the company, the combined companies will still be called Primo Water and we'll be uh, doing what we've done here in the U.S. and Canada. We'll be able to do that in the 21 countries that COD operates in now. So Primo will very quickly become a international water company. Wow. Going to be real big then. Yep. Uh, we're, we're all over. We'll be more than $2 billion, uh, in, in sales. So uh uh, it's a nice marriage. We're excited. Wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any different lessons as you grew Primo than, than Blue Rhino that you learned? Any other lessons you want to share about starting and growing a company? And then we'll move on. You, you know, I, I think uh, some of the lessons I try to always apply the, the failures you have to uh, learning and not committing the same mistake twice. And uh, I, I did a lot of that. One of the things that, that did pop up that, that I would share with folks is that oh, work for me. All these things that I, I tell people, this is what worked for me. It may not work in your case. But, but for me, it seemed like every time I, stri- I tried to stray away from my core business that I had a failure. I, I knew that I had a, uh, a niche in this five gallon exchange business that I, that we knew more about than anybody in the world. We could do it better, cheaper, faster, and we could grow it well. We tried some things like single serve water. We tried to do a sparkling water. All those things were complete failures. We really, we, number one, we didn't know a lot about them. Number two is, we couldn't dominate those segments the way we can. And I think it's important to go into something, make sure that niche is large enough that, that you can make something that people want to be a part of out of it, but dominate that niche and don't get into things that you're going to be one of 33 players. in. I see. So once you find your thing in a market that's wide enough and has potential, just stick with that and, Double down on that. Is that what you're saying? Build a moat around it and see how large you can make it. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing the, your journey. And it's always interesting to hear the backstories and some of the lessons learned along the way. Uh, over, over the time, over your time with your, your businesses and, and your life, while you were building these businesses, you operated by what you call your five principles for life and leadership. Maybe you could share those with the listeners and and we can talk just briefly about each one so people understand your mindset and some of the philosophies that you live by that helps you be successful. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad to. Thanks for letting me share them. And I I will say that, uh, you know, these are things that I, I did through the years, but it wasn't until I've had time to really reflect and look back that I tried to really put them into uh, 
five categories that I think could help other people. But, uh, but, but the five things that, that, that I try to tell other entrepreneurs that, that have helped me, uh, first is to dream big. Tell people, you know, uh, nobody wants to follow a small idea. You're not going to attract the people nor the capital uh, that you need. And quite frankly, it's not that much more difficult to do something really large. It has the same problems, just a few more zeros behind it. It takes a little more capital and people. So uh, my, my first one I tell people is to dream big. Yeah. Any advice around that? Um, it sounds like it was a lot of stress, like having to raise capital and do all this big stuff and you make it sound so easy, but it sounds like there was a bit of stress, um, you know, compared to something smaller, but any advice around dreaming big and, 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 and that first principle that you, you talk about? Well, I, I think that if you're not interested in dreaming big and taking that kind of risk, and uh, being up for the challenges that you have to go for, maybe you need to hop on someone else's dream and help them do that. Because that, that's what being an entrepreneur is. It does require you to, uh, to take that risk, to take that plunge. Yeah, okay. And so what's your, what's your second principle? My, my second one is, is to be authentic, authenticity. Uh, I tell people it, it is just so important to be genuine and real uh, to gain the trust that you're going to need for people to follow you. Um, I, I, got, I got a story on that one I, that um, uh, about George Bush, George Bush 43, when he was running for president the first time. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to have lunch with him. He, he had just lost the New Hampshire primary. And he was telling me, I, I, we were talking about, I, I was starting Blue Rhino and I was telling him about raising money and, you know, sometimes how, how difficult it is for a guy from the South who's got this uh, talk slow and goes to New York and Boston and people, you know, look at you differently and uh, uh, how intimidating it is sometimes. He looked at me and he said, Billy said, I lost the primary and said, my dad called me back home and said, son, said, I saw you up there. You were telling everybody that you went to Harvard Business School, you went to Yale, and you were trying to act like this Ivy League scholar. Hmm. He said, son, you're no Ivy League scholar. <laughs> he said, you're from Texas. He said, you walk like it. You talk like it and people are either going to like you for what you are or they're not. But for God's sake, don't try to act like something you're not. Hmm. So I took that to heart. I, I, I went back to New York the following week and I was standing in this big ballroom giving my presentation. I started out, I said, hey, folks, I know that I talk slow but I think fast. A lot of you ought to try it. <laughs> but he got a big laugh and everybody always talked about me for that. And, 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 and I just tried to do that throughout, throughout the rest of my career. I am who I am. I was born where I'm at, but uh, uh, you gotta, you gotta be yourself. And I think people will trust you for it. And that helps that characteristic permeate through your organization when you as the leader are, yourself and you're encouraging others throughout the company to be themselves. It, what helps with communication and connection and rapport and all those things throughout the company? It certainly does. And, and in fact, I, I really don't want those people in my company who aren't authentic. Okay. Who they are because you never know what they're hiding. Right. Okay. So, and then the third one is. The third one is discipline. Uh, I really think you have to be disciplined. The, uh, the disciplines I learned at an early age on the farm, of getting up early and having those chores and have, having the things that I had to do every day. Uh, hey, the, the cows got to be fed every day. You, you, don't, you don't stop. Those kind of disciplines in life and in business are important. Still today, I, I, I've got my routine 
of what I do personally, of getting up early, reading some scripture, exercising, and, and how I eat and how I go about life. In my business, I have a routine that everybody in our company knows what day we close the books, when we get together to review, when we, what we do. Every business needs a routine. And I think the disciplines uh, are really important for success if you're going to be successful. Right. Having the routines. So real quick, what, what does your day tend to look like as the, uh, as a leader of a big company like that? Um, you know, I, I, I get up early, uh, you know, five thirty, five forty five every morning. Um, I, I usually read a little scripture and try to count my blessings before I open up email because I know once I open that email, yeah. uh, all bets are off. But I, but I do that first, and then 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 I I, I look to see what is uh, important uh, going on in the company. Uh, I, I go out and I exercise, and I'm ready to uh, start the day full of energy and uh, feeling good about myself and, and whatever the world wants to throw at me that day. From there on. So you're a big believer in the morning routine then to kind of juice your body up, get your mind clear and focused, and, and so you can show up as your best self each day, having that morning time is key. I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. And I think you got, you got the world's going to throw a lot of things at you that day and you have no idea what it's going to be. Okay. Be ready for it. Very cool. All right. Moving on to your fourth principle then. My, my, my fourth is, is resilience. Uh, and, and that goes back to some of the stories I, I, I told you. It's not going to be easy. And if you as the leader show that you are concerned about what's happening or if you don't show the confidence to get through the down periods, you're never going to get there because everybody has down periods. Everybody is going net. When, when, you, when you draw a business plan, you got the sales going from straight from the bottom left to the top right. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> it's always going to have some dips in it. You got to be able to get through the dips. You got to be able to come out of the dips. And you got to show the resilience that is going to inspire everybody around you to do the same. Very good. Absolutely. Okay. And then what's the, the final one? And then we'll have you recap those for people. Yeah. The final one that has really helped me is uh, I made God the foundation of my life in, in all that I do. And if you think about it, as if, if you will put your trust and confidence in something higher than you, if you will operate your, your business principles on infinite timelines instead of a finite timeline. Mm -hmm. These things become minuscule when you have problems. Uh, so the fact that I've put God at the foundation of my life has really helped me as I try to achieve all these things in life. Yeah, that's wonderful to have that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, maybe you want to recap those real quick, Billy, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, the last part of the interview, and then we'll wrap it up here. Yes, sir. No okay, the, the, my five principles is first to dream big. Second is authenticity. Third is discipline. Fourth is resilience. And the final one is make God the foundation of what you do. And you really feel that these have been, as you look back on your journey, the, the, the pillars, so to speak, of why you've been able to keep going and have the grit and determination and everything needed to get what you've done done in life. It, it is. Those, those are the principles that have helped me in my life and leadership. Perfect. Cool. Well, let's, um, I'd like to ask you a question looking forward then into your life. Uh, you know, in, I know you're a part of an organization that focuses on the second half of your life and in the planning process there and all those things. But um, as you, cause you're in the process now of stepping down or, or you're, you're, you're being acquired, right? Primo is being acquired and you're not going to be, you're, you're going to kind of take some time once again to look at what's next for you. 
What, what kind of impact are you looking to make moving forward into the second half of your life? Yes, the the, the organization you talked about was halftime. I, yes. I highly recommend it for someone that is going through uh, looking at their next chapter in life and how to do it. And and I have taken time to stop and reflect on that and and really uh, think about what I'm going to do. And in fact, I, I wrote a a mission statement or a purpose on, on what I see for this next chapter. And, and that is to use my entrepreneurial skills and experiences to inspire my family, my business associates, and community to live a better life. Mm. And, and as I think about that, you know, those three things, my family, my businesses, because I still have several businesses I'm involved in, and my community. How can I divide my time and energy and take my experience, like those five disciplines and those other things, to help them build a better life and live a better life? Mm. That I'm trying to find ways to do that. One of the reasons I'm sitting here talking to you today, John. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, what, and when you say inspire, are you talking more like, like um, speaking more or sharing more of your experiences with others? Um, is that kind of what you see or what does that look like for you? That is, that, that is, it is speaking, getting people to think about, uh, their, their place in life, how they're going to use their skills and experiences. And, and then it, it may be go beyond that into some mentoring or, uh, investing into some of these, uh, people that, uh, I can, I can help change some people's lives. Absolutely. It's a wonderful time to be alive. You know, we're so connected this, in, in this day and age and, you know, it's, you can touch literally millions of people with, with your, with your knowledge, with your gifts, with your talents. And I'm sure those people are going to be blessed when, when you uh, start focusing on that um, next part of your life. So very cool. All right, Billy. Well, um, that's the last question in the interview here. Any parting words or anything you'd like to leave the listeners with? so that they can uh, take that with them? And then, and then where can people, if they do want to reach out to you, how's a good way to, to do that? Yeah, well, well, I'd be glad for people to reach out to me. Uh, email would be the easiest way. And, and my email is bprim, P-R-I-M, at primowater.com. And, and I'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, and, I, and I think in just closing that I, that I would say that, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't look at myself as having any particular special talent, but I did try to learn from the people around me and how other entrepreneurs have been successful and take those practices and implement them into some ideas that I had that really worked for me. And I hope that others will take that challenge to do so. Absolutely. Well said, Billy. Thank you so much for coming by, sharing your insights, your, your stories, your, your aha moments, your lessons learned. Uh, you've, you've done some incredible work throughout your life. And everyone uh, who can hear from you would be blessed to, to listen to you and acquire the knowledge that you have. So thank you for coming by. And if you are inspired by this message, you can reach out to Billy. It's bprim at primo with an i primo water.com if you want to email billy i'll link that up um, on the show notes page here as well as um i think i don't know if you're on linkedin much billy i think you gave me the profile but um yes. there'll be some resources below this this video if you want to reach out to billy as well so i hope you enjoyed this interview with billy prim of blue rhino and primo water and um we'll talk to you guys on the next one take care everybody thank you